We've been covering all kinds of topics from Israel to the, church, the, the position of the church. Last week we talked about the tribulation and what that time is like. And, you know, it's, it's hard for us to swallow what's happening. The idea of these 144,000 chosen people to be evangelists during this time, these two witnesses. And then at the end of that tribulation, we saw Satan being bound and thrown into the pit. Let's read that passage as we start today's message. Revelation chapter 19 and verse 19, it says this, And I saw the beasts and the kings of the earth with their armies gathered to make war against him who was sitting on the horse, not on the throne, on the horse, and against his armies. And the beast was captured, and with it the false prophet who was in the presence of uh, in its presence had done the signs by which he had deceived those who had received the mark of the beast and those who had worshipped the image. These two were thrown in, alive into the lake of fire that burns with sulfur. And the rest were slain by the sword that came from the mouth of him who was sitting on the horse and the birds were gorged with their flesh. Man. This end of this tribulation was amazing. And then I saw the angel come down from heaven holding in his hand the key to the bottomless pit and the great chain. And he seized the dragon, the ancient serpent, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years and threw him into the pit and shut it up and sealed it over him that he might not deceive the nations any longer. Notice that phrase, that he might not deceive the nations any longer until, I always love that, until... The thousand years were ended. After that, he must be released for a little while. What in the world? Why would God throw Satan into the pit? The war is over. We're done with him. And then he says, well, I'm just going to do that for a thousand years. And then. And, and then what? Have you ever wondered whether God was fair? Come on, let's be honest. I mean, there's often times in our lives where we struggle with the idea, well, man, it was God was fair. I, I've gotten arguments a lot of time with atheists that says, listen, why would a loving God even allow the serpent in the garden in the first place to deceive Adam? And that's a whole long story. We can talk about that later. But oftentimes we get in these battles about fairness of God. We, we get in this struggle whether is, is this God of ours fair? Let me tell you something. God is just and God is loving God is merciful. God is fair. God is fair. I want you to think about that today. Because this idea, argument that God is not fair is old news. It's old news. We see it. We hear it. We, we, it's an excuse to not follow Jesus. I'm letting you know that Jesus is going to set up a situation where there will be another great act of mercy. And yet there will be no more excuses. You see, humanity is going to be given this opportunity to know Jesus personally reigning and ruling and being available to all men. Satan is going to be bound and there will be no excuses. Now, just thinking about that, Jesus himself, I mean, come on, think about your buddy who said, listen, if Jesus would just show up here, I would believe him. You ever had that happen? I had a guy tell me that, like, listen, if your God was so real, if he would just show up, if he, you know, that's some hocus pocus story. Guess what? Jesus is going to show up. And then you're going to say, and? He right, he, he right there. Well, now what you got to say. See, listen, this is going to be the setting for what we're going to talk about today. It's called the millennial reign of Christ. And we don't talk about it very much. Matter of fact, most people don't even understand what's happening. And I will, I will tell you this, there's a, a lot of opinions on this time, okay? So please understand this. I'm going to present an opinion based on what I believe the scripture says. And don't curse me out if you don't think I'm right. It's okay. I'm, I'm used to people thinking that they're right and I'm not. So it's all right. But if you have your Bible, let's open it up to Revelation 20 in chapter 4. Remember, the pit has just been, has been happening. Here's what we saw. This is what we saw. Okay, Satan's thrown into the, to the pit. We're getting ready to hear the next few words, and this is what John saw. Then I saw thrones, and seated on them were those whom the authority to judge was committed. Also I saw souls from those who had been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus, for the word of God. 
And those who had not worshipped the beast or its image or had not received the mark on their foreheads and their hands, they came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. Okay, so we got this idea. Then it says this, the rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. Now this last passage goes with the next verse. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is the one who shares in the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power, but they will be the priests of God and of Christ, and they will reign with him for a thousand years. Okay, so we've got this thing going on. We have this millennial age. Satan is, is thrown in. Christ has shown up. Everybody said, holy, 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 worship the God. He comes down. He establishes this palace in Jerusalem, his temple. We're going to talk about it in a, in, in a little while. But who's there? Who's at this place? Man, we, those that are part of the first resurrection, are there. Okay? Believers in Christ, when, the, when those who have received Christ hear the calling, we are the ones that are going to be called. Notice Revelation chapter 20 and verse 6. Blessed and holy is the one who shares in the first re- resurrection over such the second death has no power, but they will be priests of God and of Christ, and they will reign for him for a thousand years. So how do we know that we're part of the first resurrection? How do we know that we're going to be the ones that are there? Notice 1 Thessalonians 4.16 says this, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven, and with a cry and a command, with the voice of the archangel, and the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Chris talked about this when he talked about the, tribula- or the rapture. In verse 17 it says this, Then he, we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we ever will be with him. Okay, so here's the picture. Who will be at this tribulation period or this, this, uh, this millennial period? Believers, Christians, you and I, those who have been caught up, believers in this age. Notice 1 Corinthians 15, 51 says this, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall all, not all sleep, but we shall be changed. What does that mean, changed? You're like, how can we reign for a thousand years if we are spirit people We're no longer part of this body. We've been caught up to Christ. Listen, we are going to be given new bodies, imperishable imperishable bodies that will last forever. Notice what it says, and it continues. In a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. For this perishable body must put on imperishable, and the mortal must put on immortality. So this millennial year time, this millennial time, you and I are going to be present We're going to be there. You and I are going to be there. We're going to be ruling and reigning. We're going to talk about that in just a second. Disciples are going to have a really special job. They're going to be ruling and reigning the nation of Israel. How do we know this? Notice Revelation 20 and verse 4 started out. He says this, I saw thrones, and seated on them were those whom the authority to judge was committed. What did Jesus say? Matthew chapter 19, 28. Flip over there. Make a note. This is what it says. Jesus said to them, he's talking to his disciples, Truly, truly, I say unto you, in the new world, when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, you who have followed me, you twelve, will sit on twelve thrones judging the tribes of Israel. So I want you to get an understanding of this millennial time. Although Anthony did say, yes, it's holy, 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 and we're going to be worshiping God, there's going to be a lot going on here that we really don't think about. And it's going to display God's incredible Character, his love, his mercy, his justice, and who he is at, uh, at, this, at this time in history. So, so if the disciples are going to be ruling Jerusalem and Israel, what, what are you and I going to be doing? What are we going to rule, get to rule? Notice 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 2. You and I, based on how we live this Christian life, we're going to play a part in what we do in this thousand-year time. How we rule and how we reign. Notice 1 Corinthians 6 2. Paul says this, Or do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if the world is to be judged by you, are you incompetent in these trivial matters? Now, listen, he's dealing with the Corinthian church and he's like, Listen, you guys can't even handle squabbles amongst yourselves. But in the thousand year reign, you're going to be ruling and reigning the world as Christ's ambassadors. So figure this little petty stuff out. I've been telling you, Christian, figure this little petty stuff out. 
If you can't solve a dispute between you and your husband or you and your wife or you and your kids, I don't know what little village you're going to be ruling, but it's going to be pretty small. <laughs> like, figure it out. Don't you know? Wow. Not only will we rule and reign, what does that mean? It means that we're going to be the priests of God, the examples of God during this thousand years, Revelation 6.2. It says this, but they will be priests of God and of Christ, and they will reign with him. Priests. Priests. You and I will be the messengers of truth. Now, you're going to say, what? During the thousand years, we're going to be the messengers of God? He's going to be present. Yes, he is. He is. And he's going to rule from Zion. We're going to find out then second. But the rest of us are going to be out in the world, ruling and reigning. Reigning, it says this, 2 Timothy 2.11. The saying is trustworthy. For if we have died with him, we shall also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. I need you to grasp what these verses are talking about this thousand year time. They're talking about this time when Christ returns to the kingdom, the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven is brought to earth, and here we have this ruling time. So who, who are we going to rule over? I mean, I thought everybody in, after the tribulation was in heaven, like it was just over. No. No, it's not over. See, those who live through the tribulation are going to bow their knee in recognition that Jesus is king. Those who have fought against him will have been killed, but there will be many, many, many people. You see, Jesus has returned. He's destroyed the armies, but the world is huge. It's not like he's killing everybody. He's not going out and slaying everyone. No, no, no. There will be people who will bow their knee before God and worship him. How do I know this is true? Isaiah says it is true. 45, 23, this is what it says. By myself, this is God speaking, by myself I have sworn. From my mouth it has gone out in righteousness. This, world shall, this word shall not return to me void. But to every knee, to me every knee shall bow and every tongue shall what? Swear allegiance. Every tongue is going to swear allegiance. Those who are remaining, those who are left, are going to swear allegiance, recognizing that Christ is king. You're like, that's not fair. I thought everybody died, and only those who loved Jesus beforehand were caught up in the rapture were left over. That's just not the way it's going to work. There's going to be people left after the tribulation, and God is going to do something so merciful and gracious, it's incredible. Now, you don't have to like it. But the reality is this, there will be those who will turn to Jesus, who will bow their knee, they will follow him and acknowledge that he is king. Philippians 2.9 says this, therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed him on, on his name above every other name. So that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in every, and on heaven, every earth and under the earth. Sorry, let me start over. I'm getting way too fast and excited about this. I'm so sorry. This is really cool stuff. Time out, my wife would say, breathe. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him a name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, and, and in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. Now I just want you to think for a moment. All those people that said, I just need Jesus to show up, that's what's going to happen. And every knee is going to bow. Every one is going to confess that Jesus is God, Lord. And then this time begins. Again, this is not the new heaven, new earth. This is not the end of the end. This is not the new beginning and the new heavens and new earth. No, this is the thousand-year reign. Wow. These will be phys physical humans. People like you and I. Now, pay attention. It says this in verse 5. The rest of the dead, who will not be there. So if we, if we know that those who are raptured are going to be the ones ruling and reigning. Those who are martyrs are going to be ruling and reigning. I think we're going to cover that in just a second. And those who have lived through the tribulation are going to be present. They're going to be submitting to the king's authority. Who's not going to be there? 
Well, those who die without Christ right now are not going to be there. It says in 20 verse 5, the rest of the dead uh, did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. So we have a group of people who have died who will not be part of any of this, will not be judged yet until the end of this thousand year time. They're not going to be present. So we know those people are all gone. Everybody who died in the tribulation, everybody who died previously without God, they're not present. So, wow. What do we know about this place? What is this time going to be like? Now, just put your mind back to the tribulation, what has happened on earth. Man, we've had things destroyed, the oceans destroyed, mountains torn up, all the islands are gone, level, everything is leveled. What is going to be happening at this time? What is this world going to look like? Man, I want you to know something. That Jerusalem will be the highest mountain that is on the earth. It will be the high place. Jerusalem will be the center point of all humanity on the earth because God will be dealing with the Jews at this time. I need you to grasp that. Isaiah chapter 2 and verse 2, it says this. It shall come to pass in latter days that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established as the highest of the mountains and shall be lifted above the hills and all the nations shall flow to it. Grasp yourself, change your mind, thousand years, Jerusalem is lifted up, everyone is going to be looking towards Jerusalem. Why? Because that's where Jesus will be reigning from. That's where he will be. Notice Isaiah 40 and verse 1. It says, comfort, comfort my people, says the Lord God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her. At her welfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned, that she shall receive from the Lord the hand doubled for her sins. Listen, he, she deserved to be destroyed, but God is going to lift her up. A voice cries in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight in the desert the highway of our God. Every valley shall be what? Lifted up, and every mountain shall be dropped down and made low, uneven ground shall be made level through rough places, a plain, and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. What is Jerusalem going to be? It is going to be lifted up, and everything is going to be leveled out. So put your mind here. We know who's going to be there. We know what's going to be happening as far as the church is concerned. What's, What's going to be in this Jerusalem temple? Now, this is a lot of information, man. This, this temple is going to be amazing where Christ dwells. Not only will it be the only pl- high place, remember, it will be the center place during this thousand-year reign. The nations will worship the Lord. They will, listen to me, they will learn about the Lord. Think about that now. It's not like God's just going to be osmosisly dropping on them all things wisdom when they submit to his authority. No, no, no. They're going to be on a journey to know who God is and learn his wisdom. Isaiah 2, 3 says this, And my people shall come, says the Lord. Come, let us go to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways and that, he may walk with, that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord to Jerusalem, from Jerusalem. This temple is going to be a place of learning. What is going to be in this temple? Now we know there's been temples of the past. If you've read, read the Old Testament, you're like, man, these temples were amazing. They had all these little fancy things and all these rooms and all these little things, in this little furniture that meant something. Let me tell you something that won't be in this temple. This temple will have no veil. What does that mean? There will be no separation between us and God. God will, has already torn the veil and made himself available to us. You need to know this temple will have no veil. It will have no showbread. Why? Why no showbread? Because Jesus will be the bread of life. It will have no lampstand. Why? Because Jesus is the light of the world. It will have no Ark of the Covenant because his glory will be in this place. The east gate that we just sang about that said he's coming through will be closed because he's already home. He's already there. This is what this place is going to be like. There's going to be incredible peace on the earth. Notice this in Isaiah 2 verse 4. He shall judge between the nations and shall decide disputes for many peoples. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up a sword against nation, neither shall they learn of war any more. What? Okay, time out. 
During this time, this thousand years, Satan is thrown away. Christ is sets up his, his, his kingdom. You and I are ruling and reigning around the world. This is what's going to be taking place. There is no more war. There's not even talks of war. They're going to destroy all their weapons. And they're going to do all things for humanity. Sounds like a great place to live, right? I mean, this is awesome. No more excuses. How will we rule? What what will Christ rule like? Isaiah 11, 1 talks about this. And there shall come forth a shoot out of the stump of Jesse. A branch from his root shall bear fruit. And the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. This is Jesus. The spirit of wisdom and understanding. The spirit of counsel and might. The spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And his delight shall be in the fear of the Lord, and he shall judge by what his eye sees and decide and disputes by what his ears hear. But the righteousness, by righteousness, he will judge the poor and decide the equity for the meek of the earth, and he shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. What? And with the breath of his lips he shall kill the wicked. Righteousness shall be the be- on his belt and his waist the faithfulness to the belt of his loins. Listen, Christ is going to rule this time with justice and righteousness. You're like, wait, 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 wait. I thought Christ came back, everybody bowed their knees, and we're all good. What are you talking about? There's this ruling that has to take place and people are going to choose badly and 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 christ is going to actually allow us to commit and judge people like on the spot that means what what does that mean that means there's going to be sin wait a second time out no room for sin you hearing me people do not think have not read do not understand this thousand year time sin is not absent Sin is not absent. Satan is absent. But guess what? When you say, well, Satan made me do it, now you're going to go, I made me do it. Because that's all you're going to have to blame. Your sister made you do it, I'm sure. Man, so sin is going to exist in the millennial reign. Hence why you and I will still have the mission, listen to this, as priests of God, to speak the truth of God to the nations. Our job is not over in this thousand-year time. We will live forever. We will live through this thousand years, by the way. We will not die. But we will have a role to play, to rebuke and judge the earth as priests of Jesus. Listen, I know you're like, I've never heard this before. Well, great. This is an amazing time. Satan is bound. Christ is ruling. There is flesh on the earth. Babies are being born. People are populating the earth. They're living longer. And guess what? For all you animal lovers, how many is an animal lover in here? Don't raise your hand. Okay, yes, you're. I know you are. There's some of you are so, I think you love your dog more than your children. They're getting the entire inheritance. By the way, if you're giving your inheritance to your dog, just make sure the church is in there. Uh, um, this is an amazing time. Read what this thousand years is like. Okay, so when Satan is bound and all the power and, and, the, and the, the, basically the curse of Satan is lifted, notice this in Isaiah eleven six: 6. The wolf shall lie down with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the young goat, and the calf and the lion and the fatted calf together, and a little child shall lead them. This is an amazing time. The cow and the bear shall graze. No more carnivores. Sorry, you meat lovers. Ouch, that's terrible. I love good T-bone, but that's not going to be a good option. (laughs) Their young shall lie down together. The lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play over the hole of a cobra. And the weaned child shall put his hand on the adder's den. They shall not be hurt or destroyed In all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of knowledge of the Lord, and the waters cover the sea. In other words, listen to me. The animal, not only are we going to bow our knee, but the animal kingdom will become as it was in the Garden of Eden. 
They will be to us things to enjoy. More than your dog today. It will be a time of absolute peace. Now get your mind around this. Absolute peace and yet people are still struggling and needing to be managed or ruled or decisions and righteousness is still going to have to be present and shared and taught. This is, this is a time when we're not done. We're not sitting around there playing a harp. Just so you know, I'm so glad. I'm hoping I get to do some of my uh, counseling during the snow machine season in Alaska. I know, like, I know that you guys are crazy, but I've been loving this weather. The snow is awesome. We were out yesterday. I'm feeling really sore today. But think about this. You're going to have a time when, you're, when the animals are present. While I was out riding yesterday, I ran across probably eight to ten moose, and I thought, wouldn't it be cool you just ride up next to them and just started petting them? I've tried to do that on my snow machine. It doesn't work really well. They run. I don't know why they're scared of me. You see, this is a time like none other. Wow. We know that people will be married and have children and grandchildren. There will be a time of lives. Why? How do we know this? We know that if, if there's children to play on a lion's den or on a snake's den, we know there, there are children. So we're having children. Isaiah 65 verse 20 says this. Not only are we going to have children, but we're going to live longer. No more shall there be, uh, not we, those that are living. No more shall there be an infant whose lives are but a few days, or an old man that does not fill out his days. For the young man shall die at a hundred years old, and the sinner, a hundred years old, shall be accursed. In other words, we're going to live in a time that is around the time like Adam lived where people lived a long, long time. Now notice this one. We're going to have a thousand years without Satan and out, without evil and without war and without fighting to do some really cool things. Now remember, the world has basically been destroyed. I mean, cities have crumbled. There is disaster everywhere. And now all of a sudden, God's like, now guys, I want you to be creative. I want you to build. We are going to do things with the fruit of our hands. Notice Isaiah 65, 21. They shall build houses and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and eat their fruit. They shall not build and another inhabit. They shall not plant and another eat. Wow, for like the days of the tree, the days of my people shall be and my chosen along, shall along enjoy the work of their hands. They shall not labor in vain or bear children for calamity, for they shall be the offspring of the blessed of the Lord and their descendants with them. The children of Israel are going to be thriving. We are going to be building. We are going to be rebuilding. We're going to be using our creativity. Guys, listen, this thousand years is going to be the opportunity for us to grasp the reality that without God, we are nothing. And on our own, by the way, we are nothing. This is going to be the story. This is the old news story. And that's the way the end is going to play. Why should we do all this stuff? Why, why are we going to be part of this? Why would God even do this creative thing? I'm telling you. He does it, obviously, to punish and, or to reward his people. He does it to fulfill a bunch of the Old Testament prophecies, prophecies. But I truly believe what we talked about earlier is what this is all about. This is about showing mankind that if God is present and God is with you and God is there and you have not given your life to Christ, but you, he's, he set your surroundings around perfection, justice and righteousness, and, and we have all this peace on earth, you will still have to choose Christ in your heart. You see, those that are born over the thousand-year millennium will have to choose Christ. You may have bowed your knee in the beginning, but four generations later, the question is, will your children and your grandchildren and their grandchildren choose to follow Jesus because of the way in which you present the truth? Even though Christ will be on the earth. I know it's mind-boggling. It seems that this can't be the case. But I'm letting you know something. If someone was in hell today and was resurrected 
Do you think they would choose Christ or they would choose their old lifestyle? It's a great question. Some of you are in the room and say, well, if he was elect, he would be chosen. I'm going to tell you something. The truth is this. Man left up to his own devices will always choose himself over Christ. No matter what the circumstances are. Don't believe for a moment that, oh, if they just had better circumstances, they'd choose Jesus. They will not. They will not. I want you to know that a perfect picture of this is Satan himself. You would think you've just been utterly wiped out. Everything you have done, God has spoken and it has been destroyed. And God says, listen, I'm going to throw you into the pit for a thousand years. You would think when he goes down after that thousand years and says, hey, Satan, I'm going to let you out. He would fall on his knees and beg for mercy. Would you not? He's destroyed him, absolutely annihilated him. And he gives him mercy. We'll say mercy for the sake of our argument. What do we know happens after this thousand year period of time? When the thousand years are ended, Satan will be released from prison. Again, the grace of God is beyond our comprehension, just so you know. It's beyond our acknowledgement. We cannot absolutely understand. Of all the people who have utterly despised the Lord, his entire life, Satan's falling from the stars when he chose to say, I am just like God, and God threw him out till this moment. We still have God saying, listen, I'm going to let you go. I'm going to let you go. Now, I don't know about you, but I would think we would run to Jesus' feet and beg for mercy. But we know this is not how Satan responds. What does Satan do in these last times? What happens at the end of this thousand years of peace? God's judging. We're ruling. The world is thriving. There is no war. Animals are at peace. I mean, what a wonderful time. How does this story end? Well, we know. It's, uh, it's amazing. It's called Deja vu. What happens? Revelation 8, 20 and verse 8, it says this. What will he do? He'll be let out from prison and will come out to repent? No. Come out to deceive the nations that are at the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog. Listen. To gather them for battle. Their numbers shall be like the sands of the sea. Okay, whoa, whoa, whoa. This seems so crazy. It's a classic picture of us thinking we're really good people. Here we've been ruled by God the Father, Jesus Christ. He's ruled the nations. His presence, his glory is right there. His righteousness and truth is in our presence. Satan is out, let out for a little bit of time. He throws one little hiccup in somebody's life and says, did God really say that? It's going to happen all over again. And guess what people who've had no temptation, no struggle, no war, what will they do? They will choose to rebel. Now, I want you to put your mind around that. They're going to choose to rebel. Here they lived in harmony. They lived under Christ's rule. They lived in perfection. They lived knowing all the answers. I can get the truth immediately. I can go straight to the Lord. He can answer my question. He can tell me how to live my life. I have this ability to be creative and do all these wonderful things under his rule. And Satan's going to walk out and say, did Christ really say? Is that really the way it is? Do you really want to be here and guess what he's going to do? He's going to deceive the nations. It's, it's almost like this crazy idea that when, you, when, when something doesn't work out exactly like you thought, and you're like, I'm just going to double down. How many of you are gambling? Never, don't, don't raise your hand. <laughs> you know, you thought you had the cards for all you, it's the Super Bowl, I forgot. Go 49ers. 
Oh! 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 oh. And, and, and you're, and you're, you, I, I've heard these crazy people about gambling during the game and while it's going on and you lose and you lose, but you, you're like, I, got, I can do it. I can win. No, you can't, by the way. You gamblers. You, eventually, you're going to run out of money. But that's what this is like. It's like, hey, listen, I'm going to, I know, I can do it. This is Satan's thinking. But it's actually not the case. It's not going to happen. Why in the world would this happen? Athletes do this. Businesses do this. The guilty do this. The pride of life. Why do we think we can make it on our own? Can I ask you that question? Why do you think you can make it on your own? That's what the people in the millennial kingdom are going to be deceived into believing. Hey, you don't need Jesus. We can rule this without him. Do you believe that today? Are you here thinking, I don't need Jesus. I can make it on my own. I'm here to tell you, you cannot. Notice verse 9. And they marched up over the broad plain. Why is there a broad plain? We already talked about it. There are no more hills. They're walking to Israel. And they surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city. Where will we be? We'll be in this city. What's going to happen? Christ is not going to show up, by the way. He's not going to walk out there and confront them at all. It's just going to happen. It says this, but fire came down from heaven and consumed them. The end. What an anticlimactic ending. The end. This thousand-year period of time is going to end with the obliteration of all those who've had every reason to live for Jesus and refuse. No more I can't blame it on Satan. No more I can blame it on my circumstance. No more I can blame it. No more blaming. You're going to be living, these people are going to be living in perfection, greatness, goodness, kindness, gentleness. They're going to be living in a place where love rules the day and they're going to reject Jesus. My friends, my friends, don't buy into the lie that God is not fair. God is just and merciful and going to set up a time and age to demonstrate his incredible, gracious love to show people that it requires them to bend their knee and submit their heart to him. And if they would, they would have eternal life. But if you don't, it's not going to matter what your circumstantial excuses are. They're just not good enough. Because it's all about Jesus. Wow. So what's going to happen at the end of this time? We're going to talk about it next week, but I'm going to give you a little teaser. Revelation 11, 20, 11 says this, And I saw a great white throne, and him who was seated on it. From his presence, earth and sky fled away, and there was no place found for them. When this happens, the true glory of God is going to show up. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne. And the books were open. We're going to talk about that next week. Then another book was open. We're going to talk about that next week, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books according to what they had done. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it. And death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one of them, according to what they had done. My friends, my friends, my friends. There is a final judgment. It's just not at the end of the tribulation period. Hmm. No, Jesus is going to give one more act of grace, one more act of kindness, one more act of I'm going to eliminate every excuse to show humanity that they need me. So if you find yourself here today struggling in your faith, I can understand. 
If you're struggling in your faith, you're probably trying to do your faith on your own. And Jesus says you can't do it on your own. You need me. If you're not placing your faith in him, you need him. If you're trying to work really hard to be a really good person and it's just not working out, guess what? It's not going to work out because you need Jesus. If you're here today and you're like, man, I just really struggle to share the gospel and I I really find it difficult and awkward and I just want you to know something, it's going to be difficult for the rest of your life until you surrender to Jesus. Jesus gives us the boldness to speak, the boldness to live, the boldness to act. Because it's his spirit within us that is what transforms us and we forget our calling. When we try to do things on our own, like in the millennial period, when it's just about a righteous environment, I'm telling you, you are going to fail in your Christian life. It requires the spirit to move within you. And every believer in the house today has the spirit within them. Therefore has the power to overcome darkness who has the power to overcome temptation, has the power to overcome fear of the gospel. My friend, if you are here today, I want to beg you, do not think for a moment you're going to somehow live through the tribulation period, live through the thousand years, and make a good choice for Jesus. Man, if you can't figure it out by now, it requires you to place all your faith in all your trust in him. Let's close with this passage. 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 1. I love this passage. Let's read it together. This is now the second letter I'm writing to you, beloved. In both of them, I'm stirring up in your sincere mind a way of a reminder that you should remember the predictions of the holy prophets. That's what I just read today. And the commandments of the Lord and the Savior through our apostles. Knowing this first, that all... Of all that scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing, following their own sinful desires. My friends, this is where we are. They will say, there, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. You've been telling me about Jesus forever. It's never going to happen. That's what it's going to be like in the end days. For they will deliberately overlook this fact that the heavens existed long ago and that the earth was formed out of the water and through the water by the word of God and that by means of these the world that had then existed was deluged with water and perished through the flood. But by the same word the heavens and the earth that now exist are stored up for fire being kept until the day of judgment and the destruction of the ungodly. Did we not hear about that? God is going to rain fire down from heaven and annihilate all those who are surrounding that city of Jesus. Jesus is not even going to step out. It's just going to be done. Wow. But do we not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years. (laughs) Ha, ha. And a thousand years is a day. The Lord is slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slow, slowness, but is patient towards you in this room. Patient towards you. Not wishing that how many should perish? Any should perish, but that all should repent. My friend, this is the moment. This is the time you need to understand God's grace is amazing. We saw it in the tribulation. We saw it in the millennial kingdom. God's grace and patience is amazing. And it's here for you right now. He has been patient. Verse 10, but in the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and its works that are done on it will be exposed Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you be in lives of holiness and godliness? In light of this, how should we live? Waiting for the hastening of the coming of the day of the Lord because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved and the heavenly bodies will melt 
as they burn. But according to his promise, we are waiting for the new heavens and the new earth, which righteousness dwells. You see, at the end of this thousand years, at the end of the judgment we're going to talk about next week, there will be absolute, 100%, all people who know and worship and pursue the one true God. And you, my friend, are part of that mission.